His book, uh, published by Columbia University Press in 2010, is called Behind the Gate, Inventing Students in Beijing. And it is a study of the emergence of students as a political category during the protests of uh, May 4th, uh, 1919, uh, and the way in which the category of students was generated through everyday uh, spatial practices. Today's talk, uh, by contrast, uh, is about the next project, the new project, about the place of Maoism in the history of the global left. Um, and there seems to be interesting connections between these two, right? Students playing an important role in both projects, uh, one, the making of students in a kind of global context in this moment of Wilsonian self-determination, and then in the 1960s, right, the export of Chinese student activism or perceived student activism uh, to um, um, Western countries, right, where students at Columbia University rose in six 1968 under the Maoist slogan to rebel is uh, justified. Uh, Fabio's work is um, is um, characterized uh, by by a probing mind focused on critical and political examination of the Chinese past and also of the scholarship on that past. Um, but just as characteristic to me in his work as this critical spirit is is a sense of of levity, uh, lightness of spirit. And diction. So, for example, the, the introduction to his book on the May 4th movement and the making of students sets a summary of, uh, of, of the critical ideas and the historical context against uh, his bidding for a poster on eBay and the strict timeline uh, that, that, uh, that that entails. Um, also, more recently, uh, Fabio wrote an, uh, a, a book review uh, of a book on uh, China and the British left that ended with, with sentences that, that characterized the same lightness of spirit. He wrote, from this very rich material, one would expect a more elaborated lesson than that it was complicated, although it was indeed complicated. Now he's here to explain uh, some of these complications to us in person. Uh, please help me in welcoming Fabio Lanza. Well, thank Christian for the very nice word, and I like that you connected the two projects um, better than I could do, probably. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here in this cold day. Um, I'm coming from Arizona, so it's really cold. Um, well, let me just start. Uh, in 1971, uh, Pantheon Books of uh, New York City uh, published America's Asia a collection of dissenting essay, essays on Asia and American scholarship. Edward Friedman and Mark Selden, the two editors, uh, explain the title of the collection, America Asia, uh, as such. Asia is America in three important ways. First, it is Americas in the sense that we impose American categories to describe, evaluate, and direct Asian experience. Our cultural chauvinism might mainly provide material for humorous self-analysis were it not for the overwhelming explosion of American economic and military might throughout Asia. For Asia is America's in this second tragic sense, that American power has channeled, distorted, and suppressed much that is Asia." End quote. America's Asia was the second volume to appear under the name of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, CCAS, uh, an organization of graduate students and very young uh, professors we had come together in 1968, in May, dates are always <coughs> significant, uh, united in their opposition to the Vietnam War, US policy in Asia, and also, and most importantly maybe, the very structure of their field of study, Asian studies. Uh, the quote I just read summarizes uh, the complicated, layered, uh, multifaceted criticism waged by the committee uh, at the time. CCAS condemned the Vietnam War, uh, but also all the economic, diplomatic, military strategies of the United States in the entire region. And Vietnam for them was the only the most clear, the clearest example of policies that constituted Asia as an extension of America's 
uh, strategic interest. These policies uh, were made viable, according to CAS, by through, through the collaboration of uh, American scholarship on Asia, that is, through the work of their own teachers. Uh, it was the previous generation of scholars, sort of the great first generation of US scholars, that had shaped the categories used to distort, obscure, and suppress the very humanity of Asian people. Uh, the concerned Asian scholar uh, for about 10 years, I would say, describe how the field and all area studies came to be constituted in the immediate post-war as part of the government project, uh, grants, fellowship foundation, CIA, Ford Foundation money. They uh, trace the influence of McCarty uh, purges. Um, and uh, they pointed at the mutual imbrication of this scholarship with the actual genocides of Asians. They basically accuse their own teachers, uh, and that includes John K. Fairbank, uh, for his moms, of genocide. Uh, uh, the field of Asian studies was then directly responsible for the making of America's Asia, for the intellectual, economic, and military appropriation of Asian and Asian people by US interests. Yet, uh, this part of the critique is, um, I think, just the least interesting one. Uh, uh, the, the critique had another more positive goal, to highlight the Asian reality that those policy and scholarship had made invisible. And this was the third way in which Asia could and should be America's Asia. And I quote, the essays in this book suggest, moreover, that an Asia conceived in an antagonistic or contemptible category is an Asia where much of this humane, valuable, and worthy of emulation is ignored. This adds a final meaning to America's Asia. If we could change our relationship to Asia, we would be open to learning much from Asian people that could help us create a more decent and just society in the United States." End quote. Asia was not just a site of oppression, location of a carnage, it could truly be America Asia, America's Asia in the sense that it offered real political alternative to the US and potentially to the world. Uh, in the CCA's analysis, Asia, once divested uh, of the culturalistic trapping the scholars and political strategies had created, appeared as one of the crucial models of global change. Asian people were, in fact, leading the transformation that we now identify as the global 60s. This final positive version of American Asia uh, encompassed uh, uh, Vietnam resistance, national war of liberation, uh, pacifist organization in Japan, a peasant activism in India, but it was obviously Maoist China, uh, as especially the Cultural Revolution, that the concerned Asian scholar identify as the experience worthy of emulation. What was going in China uh, exceeded uh, its geographical, historical, cultural position, as Maoism challenged the political assumption of people globally. The very last sentence of the book, uh, which is by uh, Steve Anders, uh, makes precisely this case. Quote, uh, ultimately, however, this process of struggle and development going on in China transcends the Chinese situation and poses critical question of action and philosophy for all of us. This paper and my larger project uh, takes the case of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholar as a way to illustrate how Maoist China, and specifically the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, came to constitute a foundation for a transnational discourse of intellectual and political change, something usually referred to as global Maoism. Uh, this particular discourse did not take place, uh, did not place at the center ethnic or culturally based value, nor it exposed like the discourse of China does today, the myth of a rise of China, a rise of Asia, and so on and so forth, in terms of geopolitical power. Rather, Maoism here is the name of a shift in the political and intellectual frame of reference in the 60s and 70s, when what, up, what was happening in Asia acquired a new relevance uh, for people all over the world within their own historical circumstances. Is this this shift that made it legitimate and logical for workers in France to ask for Vietnam in our factories or for many Parisian students to call themselves Chinois, Chinese? 
And it is to French Maoism that I turn as a comparative case to highlight precisely the complexity but some shared trait in the meaning of Maoism outside China. I want to be very clear. I'm talking of Maoism outside China uh, during the long 60s. The comparison between French Maoism and CCIS is unwieldy. And the CCIS people still around will really yell at me if I call them Maoist. They were not Maoist. Uh, they were not a political party either. But China and Maoism identified uh, a set of themes and practices that were shared across these two very diverse situations. Uh, first, in both cases, China did not simply name and cultural and national location. I use China like this, but I get tired of doing this and I feel silly, so I don't. But imagine China with quotes. Uh, uh, rather, it identify a set of ideas and practice produced by political actors that happen to be Chinese. Uh, Global Maoism was, the was therefore the first major instance in which people around the world approach Asians in a potentially non-orientalistic way, uh, as subject with the right to original thinking and independent political practice. Second, Maoism name a fundamental alternative both to the capitalist and the Soviet model, uh, precisely at a time where both in France and the US uh, capitalism uh, was uh, in crisis, I would say. Radical movement had sort of pointed at the inequality that persisted after the post-war boom. Uh, and in this context, Maoism showed the potential for an egalitarian path to development, one not limited to Asia. Third, the crisis of the 1960s invested directly the privileged occasion of politics in France and the US, the political parties. Uh, this is the period of sort of the 68, if you think of Chicago 68, the crisis of the Democratic Party, and France, the, the sort of collapse or, or the radical crisis of communism, especially the, the, the PCF, the, the French Communist Party. Um, the Cultural Revolution then appeared as the final attack to the validity of any privileged location for politics and a declaration of, for, of the legima legitimacy for people to organize independently of the state. Finally, Maoism interpolated intellectuals, students, and teachers directly. The Cultural Revolution addressed issues that could not but call into question the daily experience of intellectuals everywhere. Uh, division of manual intellectual labor, role of science and objectivity, relationship between politics and knowledge, um, and transmission of learning, the ideological structure of the transmission of learning. All these were crucial problems that both the CCS and the French Maoists dealt with. And Maoism, in this sense, provided both U.S. scholars and French Mao radicals the vocabulary and the grounding to criticize the, extenting, the, the existent and proposed alternatives. Uh, the meaning of China in the 60s, however, despite my claim that it is separated from its cultural uh, a cultural definition could not be separated from specific historical condition, the very existence of, you know, really existing socialism. Um, this condition changed drastically in the mid-1970s, and this was reflected both in the U.S. and uh, in France, uh, especially after the death of Mao in 1976. Uh, CCIS entered in a profound crisis, and the organization disbanded in 79, the journal they edited, they published, still exist, however. Uh, some of these members left academia, other of their own volition or because they didn't get tenure. Uh, some shifted to very different position and other moves to different form of activism. A similar disbanding took place in France uh, where it involved not only the collapse of all Maoist organizations, but also uh, a radical denial of those positions by most of the leading Maoist intellectuals. Uh, some of them uh, became eventually part of the Sarkozy government, like as a sort of a final mockery, I would say. Uh, I'm not interested in this paper, I'm very clear, uh, of tracing uh, personal blame or assessing the political fidelity of intellectual scholar activists. That's not the point, although there is a large part of our organizational studies, institutional, I mean, I'll, you know, 
personal interview and so on and so forth. Um, I'm concerned here with the condition, the historical opening that made the discourse of Maoism and China central both to the project of CCIS and to radical organization in France. Um, I'm concerned with what the discourse did in both cases and obviously with the closure, the end that made this discourse uh, unthinkable. Uh, this is a book-length project, uh, very much in, pro in progress. So uh, uh, for the rest of my talk, I will just hint at two issues. Uh, one, how China worked, how, how China, again, work in the thinking of these two groups, or, uh, and uh, on the question of objectivity and science. Um, the defining character of the Asian Revolution, according to CCAS, was that they presented a new humane alternative, uh, which as such required a humane approach to be understood. I was actually struck when you read the CCAS uh, papers how they insist on this humane, humane. China, uh, we have to make the Chinese humane again. We have to consider Chinese to be human again. We lose the humanity, and I was puzzled. Um, the, part the, the participatory model of Vietnam and China offered, uh, quote, hope of more humane forms of development and of effectively overcoming the formidable barriers to the transformation of peasant societies, end quote. This was Mark Selden. Uh, similarly, John Gurley described the Cultural Revolution as, quote, perhaps the most interesting economic and social experiments ever attempted in which tremendous effort are being made to achieve an egalitarian development an industrial development without dehumanization, one that involves everyone and affects everyone, end quote. Here I think humane uh, stands in stark opposition to models, uh, both capitalist and socialist, uh, that were considered to be inhumane uh, because they erase the human, uh, the human cost of development under the mask of scientificity and rationality. Humane refers to the radical equality of the Asian Revolution, as exemplified first and foremost by the Chinese experiments of the 60s and 70s. Uh, again, let me be very clear. Uh, everything I say should be with perceived by perceived. Uh, uh, it's, we're talking at a time when knowledge of what's going on in China is limited, especially in the, well, both in the US and France. Um, the reference to humanity also expressed a frontal attack to modernization theory, which had dominated uh, US state policy and Asian studies. The understanding of societies in terms of modernization levels and stages of development was connected with the foreign policy that imposed these models onto other nations. Then, according to CCAS argue, those Asian revolution that presented practices alternative to this model could only be understood through a more humane scholarly approach, one that abdicated the technocratic culturalistic framework of the existing social sciences. Accepting the humanity of Asian revolution required a radical shift in the very structure of academia and in the intellectual world. Uh, it was the recognition that something new was happening in Asia that allowed for many of the exceptional uh, scholarly contribution of the early period of the uh, concerned Asian scholar. And I could name some, but I don't have time. Uh, what I find perhaps more interesting with CCIS is how the recognition of the extraordinary value of Asian revolutions allowed for the expansion of connections and spaces of comparison. Based, uh, based on the assumption that China truly had something to say to, the, to America and the world. Uh, for example, it led to uh, CCIS 25 Asian models for agrarian revolution in um, Latin America. Uh, it justified a new understanding of Asia, uh, viewed through the lens of hope for more radical transformation. Uh, CCS discussed whether there was something called Asian socialism, which connected China, Korea, Vietnam, but also India and South Asia. Uh, India, uh, argued uh, Gail Omvet, who was an India specialist, quote, might be used as a negative case to prove that without socialism there is no economic development. India needs what China had, a revolution. And to some extent, the Indian problems enable one to understand what happened in China. Uh, in the sense you see Maoism uh, work 
China, in a sense, work as a sort of a global signifier, allowing for a uh, network of connections. Uh, China and Vietnam shift from being simply America's problem to embodying the focal point for a series of Asian connection, a network of activism for which they represented a possible reference. The example of Maoist China work uh, in a very similar way in the completely different context of 1960s France. Uh, the conservative scholars, as I say, were not Maoist, uh, and China represented an example from which drew implication for their own reality and for world reality, uh, uh, not a template to mimic. French Maoists are often, and still today, depicted as under the spell of an adolescent fascination with the revolutionary East. Yet, they too, in the same way, strove to avoid any silly imitation and stated repeatedly on that theirs was not an old cell transplant. Alain Gesmar, at his trial, uh, defending uh, the indigenous French tradition of struggle and revolution and denying categori any categorically an intention of transposing mechanically what other people have realized or of rebuilding China in France. As Georges, a young member of the Gauche Proletarienne, uh, the largest Maoist party, maintained, the issue was not, quote, to apply directly the thought of a Chinese leader to the reality of a French factory, end quote. Rather, he concluded, in much more direct language, we don't really give a fuck about China. La Chine, on s'en fout. Uh, the lesson of Mao is, was not one of certitudes and easily transferable programs, it was one of lived experience. This was described, once again, by the French too, as a more humane experience. The Cultural Revolution was viewed as a reaction against a tendency to value productivity of our people, and it was this aspect that, in the words of two miners from the south, uh, from the north, sorry, of France, resonated with the live practice uh, in France, where two the worker was like an animal. It was in the light of the shared experience of debasement and of the need to put men first that what was good for China could, as they say, be good for us too. It didn't matter that, as another gauche proletarian member lamented, uh, that her fellow workers did not accept the Maoist because it was a Chinese thing. If what they told me about Maoism is correct, she said, we are all Maoist. Maoism was, she said in the end, largely open. Uh, French workers and students could invoke the Chinese experience not as a plan to import and follow step by step, but as a call to extend the limits of what was politically conceivable, a as a proof that the new life was possible. In the discussion of modernization theory and European Sinology, China and Asia could exist uh, as unities only in the vaguely geographically identifi identifiable repository of historical cultural values, removed from the normality of natural development. They were exceptional. Uh, even, uh, uh, even when brought back through colonial force into the normal path of history, Asia, as Deepesh Chakrabarty synthesized, remains the realm of the not yet, endlessly catching up and endlessly lacking. In the era of global Maoism, however, it is not yet. The space between Western normativity and Asian exceptionalism, uh, instead of a lack of a failure, becomes an opening, a space of experimentation, the name of what could be possible. Here, Asia, as Chris Connery argues, is, quote, an unfinished project whose truth is not in a new and emergent, is in a new and emergent dominant, but in the end of a very logic of domination." End quote. I think it is precisely in this sense that we should view the meaning of China and Maoism in the global 60s. In the best of CCS analysis, as well as of, of French Maoist political argument, China prefigured the potential universality of egalitarian and emancipatory politics. To take China seriously, um, in this sense, had important implication for what it meant to be a scholar, both as an intellectual and as an activist. CCS was an organization of graduate students, a young professor, and the French Maoist uh, emerged largely from the 
uh, fracture of the first uh, Maoist student union, I mean, from, you know, students, again, in 68. The, the union was from 66. It is therefore not surprising that the issue related to the politics of, no of knowledge were uh, crucial on both sides of the Atlantic. In the case of CCAS, uh, this take form not only but first as a critique of objectivity. CCAS starts from the recognition that scholarship is inextricably linked to politics and all research ultimately reflects a political standpoint. Uh, they spearheaded a radical critique of the belief in objective scholarship that framed the entire field. They skewered their own professors, and again, John K. Fairbank features prominently in that, uh, uh, when these men hid behind academic neutra neutrality. The Constellation Scholar argued that neutrality was already a political stance, one that implied acquiescence to existing policies, an assumption. Uh, the claim to objectivity also operated in a more pernicious way uh, in Asian studies. The empirical and allegedly rational approach it fostered was blind to the new things of America's Asia, uh, as it ended filtering through a specific idea of modernization and development, the spirits of people who refuse and challenge that very idea. Uh, According to CCAS, the experiments of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution in China could not be understood in the rational economic terms of modernization theory. Their novelty resides precisely in that human side, you know, that remain invisible to an objective analysis. But this did not seem to be enough for uh, many in the group. Scholarship was often perceived as a fruitless endeavor and that true activism reside elsewhere in the real world. Being just scholar, concerned or not, was also made difficult by the very Asian experience that CCS were examining, uh, which challenged the core role of intellectuals. Students in Paris and Berkeley or Columbia were discussing the Chinese Cultural Revolution not because of a blind worship of an exotic model, exotic and misunderstood model, uh, but because they realized that what seemed to be at stake in China had to do with issues that concerned their own daily experience. You know, production of knowledge, reproduction of social roles, and so on and so forth. And all these issues were crucial to the experience of CCES. Objectivity, daily life, and the position of intellectuals vis-a-vis uh, -vis political organization were also uh, central elements in the debates of the French Maoists. Uh, Maoists came to France in a very, came to the intellectual circles of France in a very strange way. It came through um, uh, as a variation of Althusserianism. When Louis Althusser, the Marxist philosopher, sort of <coughs> recovered Mao as a tool to oppose uh, a perceived political turn of the French Communist Party. Uh, it was from the group of Althusser brilliant students uh, at the École Normale Supérieure in Rue de Lulme, uh, that the founders of the first Maoist Students Union emerged in 66. And it was in the splits between the students, among the students and between the students and their teacher, uh, that uh, in 68, that we can see more clearly the challenge the Maoists presented to French Marxist intellectual. Uh, the philosopher Jacques Rancière uh, was one of Althusser's students. Uh, and broke with his teacher precisely on the position of the Maoist intellectuals when faced with the mass activism of 1968. Althusser had reaffirmed the scientific nature of Marxism and assumed Maoism as a more scientific theory to stave off the humanist derive of the French Communist Party. Uh, science, for Althusser, was the antidote to ideology, scientific truth, the opposite of false consciousness. This view placed the work of the Marxist theoretician straight on the side of objective truth, science. Uh, those extracting him, it was always a he, never a she, by the way, from any imbrication with the dirty work of ideological reproduction. There was no idea involved in the pure task of the philosopher, the intellectual. That was Althusser's point. 
However, as Rancière points out, precisely while the serve was arguing for a purity of science, the study of science was being seriously questioned in China by the Cultural Revolution and in the West by scientists who wanted to discuss science as enslavement to power, capitalism, and war. And here lies one evident connection between the criticism of objectivity in CCIS and the criticism of Marxist sciences in France. Uh, in this connection, the example of China and the Cultural Revolution was crucial. Contrary to Althusser's understanding, Maoism did not proclaim the separation of the science from ideology, rather it focused the attention on the role of the scientist and intellectual in reproducing relationship of domination through the exercise of pedagogical and research function, but also in the minute aspect of daily life. Maoism, and that's Rancière, uh, uh, declared the capacity of the masses to speak and subvert the domination without and often against the wise guide of the philosopher, scientist, party leader, and so on. So the assumption by the revolutionary masses of the right to speak against the authority of their teachers during the Cultural Revolution or, or May 68 was the manifestation, according to Rancière, of a new intelligence. The intelligence formed in the struggle, the knowledge reclaimed for the ends of the exploiters. Maoism, in this perspective, the name, the affirmation, and the realization of the competence of the masses. And as such, Rancière ended, the cultural evolution destroyed the very place of the educator, be it the philosopher or the party itself. The conservation scholar, I'll try to be quick here, uh, never formulated a critique at the level of abstraction and complexity uh, produced by Rancière and other French Maoists. But they do saw the Cultural Revolution as the embodiment of a continuing search for uh, uh, a conceptualization of the political and for theory of the production of knowledge. Uh, a similar search animated CAS, um, and uh, there were, for example, several meetings during uh, the summer of 1968 at Harvard. They had the summer uh, seminar in which actually the book, the essay for America's Asia, this edited volume, were sort of thought out. And large part of this meeting dealt precisely with the self-definition of this young scholar and their relationship to politics. The group, the group discussed the impossibility of fragmenting one's lives into discrete compartments, their scholarship, their activism, but also ponder what radical meant, professionally and in terms of everyday life. Uh, in really through the minutes of this evening discussion in Cambridge, um, and thanks God for the self-recording effort of these people, uh, one gets a glimpse of an already existing division in the group. The split between those, those who aim at the radical scholarship and others who were proposing a complete redefinition, complete redefinition of what scholarly meant. A re theoretical rethinking of profession in general and not just in relationship to US politics. They maintain, this latter group, that the radicalism could not involve just the content of our publication, but it also required a reconceptualization of what scholarship and the scholar themselves were. Uh, however, and that's a sad part, for all their criticism of the field and their attempt at reformulating their own intellectual practices, CCIS could not truly dispel the lure of objectivity. In the end, the participants in the 1968 seminar could only agree on the truism that truth is by nature radical and that the responsibility of the intellectuals was to expose lies, lies of the government in this sense. This was not an impressive result and in part it had to do with the models of scholarship available at the time. Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Stoughton Lind were among the few public intellectuals in recent US history who were exceptional examples of activism but they were also intellectuals whose main body of scholarship was critique, not conceptualization. Their personal and professional experience exemplified the tension between scholarship and politics, but they have very little to say about it, at least in the terms that many within CCAS expire. Chomsky and Zinn took part in the early activism of CCAS, uh, presented at convention, and Chomsky was a member of the editorial board of the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholar for several years, while he was not an Asian scholar. Chomsky also was, quite surprisingly, an occasional participant in the Harvard Summer Seminar of 1968, as I just mentioned. 
The truism that truth is by nature radical was a direct reference to Chomsky's contributions to the discussion. And he stressed on the value of objective truth in revealing the weak points of US ideology. It was intellectually a blunted weapon against the ideas the CIS uh, were, was fighting against, as modernization theory was founded on the very assumption of the objective character of scientific truth. If the task of the radical scholar was just to dismantle the previously accepted truth and substitute for it new, real, more objective truth, well, then in the end, that had no effect on the ide ideological and institutional structure that allowed for still alternative truths to be produced. Or, to use the language of Zach Rancher, much more Maoist, quote, the struggle of science against ideology actually benefits bourgeois ideology because it strengthens two of its crucial bast bastions, the system of knowledge and revisionist ideology. Ideology and science were not separated at all, and the transmission of science was indeed an ideological operation. It was therefore illusion, illusory to pretend that one could simply replace the content of science and truth, leaving unchanged and untouched the space where these truths are inscribed, the very ideological system in which they are reproduced as object of knowledge and framed within a specifically uh, organization of learning and daily uh, practice. Uh, that's why, precisely at the time when these young concerned Asian scholars were discussing in Cambridge, uh, other students in China and Paris were rising against academic confinement and against the school itself as an ideological apparatus. The faith in the power of truth was not uncritically accepted. Uh, even during the summer of 68, uh, the Harvard Seminar, more is needed than speak the truth, they argue. Another level is the perceived need for being radical with the vision of enlarging human potentiality, the need to live unified lives, whereby scholarship and being radical come together. The assessment that the objective truth is radical did not solve the conundrum of those who wanted to truly integrate scholarship and politics, as in many ways it postulated once again, once again a divided life. One could follow the Chomsky model, write prolifically and successfully within one subdiscipline in Asian studies, in Asian studies and devote his, her, again, mostly his uh, <coughs> activist efforts to debunking the myths of US foreign policy, or stand up for human rights and fight for the liberation of political prisoners. All extremely worthwhile endeavors, but in many ways, a retreat from the opening that America's Asia and Maoism had allowed. Uh, I don't have a great conclusion, but I'll sum it up. Uh, by the mid-70s also, empiricism, faith in objectivity, left no respite, provided no help. Objectively, uh, in China, then Xiaoping was dismantling all the new things that had existed before. The Cultural Revolution was over. Vietnam went towards normalization. Cambodia stood on the precipice of madness, and India did not have a peasant revolution, and capitalism was triumphant. So objectively, there was no much respite. There was nothing. And from the total crisis, it was very difficult to reemerge. As I described, the best of the CAS actually went through the Chomsky route and you know, perceived activism in in this separate way. Uh, and the French Maoists, as I mentioned, are even more, um, the failure is even more radical. Uh, Maoist China disappear uh, from reality uh, after the 70s and retreat securely in a place of imagination, as I think Ronald Castro say, we live in the China in our ads. Um, with that, I think this appeared also the possibility that Asia or the Third World could appear as anything but victims of imperialism, of human rights violation, of authoritarianism, or at best, imperfect copies of the West. Um, maybe this, this was unavoidable. I'm not uh, f blaming anybody. Uh, 
But now that we find ourselves in a different historical situation that um, Maoism is past, uh, the experience of global Maoism should remind us of the possibilities and openings for scholarship and politics that China did embody when it was understood as a globally significant yet always unfinished project of emancipation. And maybe it's finally time to look at those possibilities uh, of that China, I mean, uh, in their historical global meaning and not simply in the light of their aftermath. And I end here. Thank you.